there was a branch in Glens Falls that was a pretty good sized branch. Um, and then all, what happened was the local local groups and local communities were to funnel their their goods, their what they manufactured, their foodstuffs, and their money to the next larger branch, who would in turn forward things on, uh, eventually heading out to the Washington area where they would be distributed. That was that was the, the theory. Um, it, it worked and it didn't work. There was with every uh, wartime effort, there's, there were always problems. Um, and then they also, uh, in the beginning, especially wanted to examine camp conditions. If you think of the healthy soldier and how many statistics like, that I just read, how many died of disease, um, there was a rudimentary understanding of, of um, germs at that point. They had, they're about 20 years away from really understanding what, what germs and bacteria really were. So, but they did understand the necessity for good sanitation and proper food, particularly for the soldiers on the march. I'm starting out in 1861, just to give you an overview of where the medical department of the Army was at that point. They were not prepared uh, in, in any way, shape, or form for what was to come. Um, the, the medical department of the Army was centered in Washington, D.C. They weren't prepared to set up field hospitals. They weren't prepared to evacuate or move wounded and sick soldiers. They did not have adequate resources. There was no hospital system, and they didn't have enough staff. So right away, uh, before the campaigns really began, in 1860, um, 1861, a group of uh, men, well-to-do, well-educated, philanthropic men, got together in New York City uh, to form uh, the uh, U.S. Sanitary Commission. They took that plant to Washington um, with some discussion and debate they were able to get the U.S. Sanitary Commission sanctioned by President Lincoln. Um, it was called, you probably heard, the fifth wheel on the coach. Um, not always welcomed by everyone, um, but in the end, they performed some very ne necessary things. These are the, uh, this is a photograph that was actually taken in 1865. It shows the officers of the Women's Central Association of Relief which was the branch, the large and important branch in New York City. And uh, the lady that's sitting sort of in front with a lighter colored uh, dress, seated with a side profile, is Christine Griffin. She actually went down on the peninsula in Virginia in 1862 to work in a hospital transport. Uh, the woman who's seated in, next to her, just to her left with her hand um, up on her chin, is uh, named Louisa Lee Schuyler. She's got somewhat of a local connection. She's the great-granddaughter of General Philip Schuyler. And um, her, um, her efforts, and this, she was the leading member of this group and um, went on after the war to become one of the founders of the State Charities Aid Bureau, which is considered a forerunner of modern social work. So very interested in um, working with um, the people in need. Uh, this is a, uh, a photograph of the Lisa Lee Schuyler during the Civil War years. Um, the, the Women's Central Association of Relief in New York was the parent, if you will, of the Albany Army Relief Association, which was also founded in 1861 uh, by 18 women, um, well, again, well-educated, well-off women. Um, generally speaking, they were uh, Protestant. They were wives of... Um, well-to-do merchants and a Protestant clergymen in the city of Albany. They banded together shortly after the war started to uh, come up with a way to uh, funnel their uh, resources into the U.S. Sanitary Commission for the help of the soldiers in need. Um, they were remark they were a remarkable bunch of women. Um, and for the most part, uh, until at 1864, it was an all-woman organization. They were well organized. They um, right away divided the city of Albany, which had a population of about 62,000 at that point, um, into the, all the different wards. There were 10 wards in the city. They divided up the streets within the city, and they canvassed. They went house to house looking for money and looking for um, contributions and people that would be willing to sew hospital garments, to sew blankets and quilts, things that the soldiers needed. 
Uh, they, were, they were a devoted and loyal uh, group of women. They stayed in, um, organ and their organization stayed in, um, in business, if you will, until 1869, so well after the end of the war. Uh, they also gathered foods. For the most part, the, the food that had to be shipped was something that needed to be packed. It was pickled, it was dry. Things that could be shipped fairly easily were, were, um, were sent. And they also spoke to other groups. A lot of local uh, small churches had their own aid societies. So the women of the Albany group would go out and speak to those, those women and say, you, well, you need to funnel your stuff to us and it'll, it'll go to, more, uh, to a better place. The first year, the donations to the Sanitary Commission from Albany were $2,465, and they sent 97 boxes of hospital supplies on to New York. Uh, people who donated um, included other schools. At that point in time, uh, people raised money by having strawberry socials and tableau and all kinds of, of uh, fun things and interesting things to do. Um, things would be followed right back into the organization. This is what they were. This is what they were trying to make better. Um, there are a few images, a few photographic images that are very graphic. Um, there are a lot of descriptions, more written descriptions than there are uh, photographs. But there are a few that show aftermath of of, of combat. And this was taken in uh, July 1862. It was during the Peninsula Campaign which, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with the Yorktown, Williamsburg area, the Northern uh, the Union Army was trying to come up from that area up to Richmond. So instead of going through the northern part of Virginia toward Richmond, they were going up through what's known as the Peninsula. And if you've ever been in that area in July, it's not a fun place to be. So if you can imagine uh, laying on the ground in all states of, uh, of being wounded, dehydrated and sick. Um, that's what the sanitary commission workers and the medical department faced in dealing with this um, the situation. The campaign started in March. Uh, there were 121,000 Union troops in that, um, in that campaign. The medical director at that point of the Army was Dr. Charles Triplett. And he was out fairly soon. By July 3rd, 1862, he was replaced by Dr. Dr. Jonathan Letterman. I don't know if you're familiar with that name. Um, it's a, he's, he was a very good organizer. He set up an ambulance system and, and a much better system of hospitals, <coughs> uh, division and field hospitals. Uh, pretty early on, there were women who um, left home to um, attend to the wounded and the sick. Now, this is Amy Morris Bradley who left the Boston area in actually August 1861, so pretty early on, to go to Washington. Um, there she met with the Reverend Frederick Knapp of the U.S. Sanitary Commission. She went to work in the General Hospital in Alexandria on September 1st, 1861. And in and around Alexandria in Northern Virginia, she worked on the hospital transports, the ships that took the wounded away from the peninsula in the spring and summer of 1862. And from there, she went to the U.S. Sanitary Commission home in Washington, and in late September, into the convalescent camp, which is outside of Washington. Amy Morris Bradley um, also wrote a book in Letters Home, and we would like to share with you um, something that Amy Bradley wrote about being on the hospital transports in June of 1862. I shall never forget my feelings as one by one those mutilated forms were brought in on stretchers and cared for the place on those comfortable cots. What, said I, must I see human beings thus mangled? Oh my God, why is it? Why is it? For nearly an hour I could not get control of my feelings. But when the surgeon said, Miss Bradley, you must not do so, but prepare to assist these poor fellows, I realized that tears must be choked back and my heart only know its own suffering. Action was the watchword of the hour. Amy Morris Bradley, June 1862, on the hospital transports off the coast of Virginia. And this 
is just one image of those, of those hospital transports where they were steamboats that were taken over by the Sanitary Commission and the Quartermaster of the Army and fitted out to be hospital ships. And that meant that each hospital was divided into wards for the different types of illness and, and wounds. And over 8,000 wounded soldiers and sick soldiers were transported away from the peninsula in 1862. Where were they taken? They, were, they needed to get out away from that area. So they first took them to Fort Monroe. And if they were well enough to be transported, they came north to Philadelphia, to New York, to the Boston area, and even to Albany. There was a good-sized hospital where eventually the wounded and sick soldiers would be taken away from, um, away from the, the place where they had been sick or wounded. In early May of 1862, 20 volunteer women arrived to work in the transports. The other uh, ships that you, it's hard to see in that photograph, but usually they had one boat that was a hospital, another boat that was nearby served as a storage, a place for hospital stores, and then another as the headquarters for the Sanitary Commission officers. Uh, there was also a surgeon assigned, a surgeon and assistant surgeon assigned to each hospital ship, a core of nurses, a dispensary where medicines would be given out, and a pantry and linen closet. And of course you can understand the necessity for cleanliness, for um, uh, washing the, the, the linens at regular intervals. Along with uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, who was uh, the General Secretary of the U.S. Sanitary Commission, and Frederick Knapp, also an officer, there were women as staff who remained on the peninsula until the transfer of troops uh, out of the area in late August 1862. Uh, Catherine Prescott Warmly was one such uh, nurse. She came from Newport, Rhode Island. Christine Griffin from New York. Eliza Woolsey Howland. Uh, from around the Fishkill area in New York, and Georgiana Woolsey, who is the uh, woman shown in this image, um, was her sister, so that the whole family was uh, involved in the, in the effort. Georgiana Woolsey, um, along with her sisters, um, served in the hospital transport service in 1862. She went from there to Portsmouth Grove General Hospital, um, which was up north. Uh, she returned to Gettysburg, in July of 1863. She also nursed at Belle Plaine, Port Royal, Fredericksburg, White House in Virginia, and City Point, which was near, near Petersburg. Um, Georgiana Woolsey um, also wrote a number of works and letters home, and they've been published. And Georgiana Woolsey's um, discussion about what happened on the hospital transports is also something that we'd like to share with you today. July, the work of the women on the hospital transports began to wind down, and by August, many had returned home, some like Catherine Prescott warmly, to work in hospitals in the north. And many of you know the name Frederick Law Olmsted as the uh, architect of Central Park. Um, his firm was in business for many, many years, and in fact, um, had a hand in designing uh, Saratoga Springs Congress Park. Um, Crandall Park in Glens Falls, and a number of well-known city parks uh, bear the name of Frederick Law Homestead. But many people don't also know that he was the, the brains behind the United States Sanitary Commission when it first um, came into being in 1861. He was an energetic man, a very well-organized man, a perfectionist, 
and by 1863, he was so burned out by what his efforts had been, and so frustrated that he couldn't do more, that he resigned his position as General Secretary of the U.S. Sanitary Commission. But that's not to say that what he did was not important. I think, he, uh, I think of him as one of the heroes of the Sanitary Commission. And in fact, when he was on the peninsula in 1862, he was doing a lot of dealings with, uh, with the military at that point and, and expressed some frustration that things weren't getting done a little better. At this point, Dr. Charles Trickler was still in charge of the medical department. And as I, I stated at the beginning, he was completely unprepared for what he was dealing with on the peninsula at that time. So we have um, Dr. A, a quote from Frederick Law Olmsted um, talking about what life was like in, on the peninsula at that point. The next morning I saw the medical director of the Army at headquarters. He seems to be in a worse boggle than ever as to the disposition of the sick. There are a great many still at Yorktown to be removed, but the work is now fairly systematized there and the sick begin to collect here uh, by the hundreds with a prospect of thousands and no thought of system in disposing of them as far as I can see. Frederick Law Olmsted, Secretary of the U.S. Sanitary Commission, June 1862. Back at home in Albany, people were hearing about these things that were going on via letters and newspaper accounts. And so they were responding on the home front in Albany and in the local communities to the needs that were expressed, uh, the dire need for supplies, the increased need for people to go down and help. And in Albany, in the, in the Albany Army Relief Association, one of the honorary members of the association was Eliza Morgan. The, go the, the sitting governor's wife was always an honorary member of this organization. And in 1862, as she was um, leaving Albany to uh, go to Buffalo, where she continued to work um, on the behalf of Soldiers Relief, she wrote a very important letter to the women in Albany who were working in the uh, area of Soldier Relief. Full. Here and there, a knot of men with a dim light near, holding amputations. A 
and shrieks and groans of the poor fellows lying all around made our hearts almost stand still. The rain fell upon all their upturned faces. We could do little that night but distribute wine and tea and speak comforting words. Then we sang. The sound stopped the shrieks and groans of the brave men. The next day was the Sabbath, stretched out in every direction, as far as the eye could reach with the dead and dying. Eliza Harris, September 1862, Antietam. In July 1863, the three-day battle of Gettysburg took place in central Pennsylvania. And after that, immediately, there were women on the field. And one of them was Cornelia Hancock who, unlike many nurses at that time, was a young woman. Most of the government nurses that were approved um, to be government nurses and be paid as government nurses were regulated. They were supposed to be over a certain age. They were, uh, it was better, uh, according to their, um, their supervisor, Dorothea Dix, that they be married and that, um, bluntly, that they should not be too attractive. Um, however, there were, that's just, that was just a rule, and it wasn't the norm for many nurses that went out on the field. Uh, Cornelia Hancock was very young. She was in her early 20s. She was a Quaker from southern New Jersey. Her family was involved you know, in the military um, to an extent. Her brother-in-law was a doctor, and it was her desire to go and to help. So she um, got on the train, and because things were so confused around Gettysburg at that time, she wasn't told to go home. And in fact, when she got to Gettysburg, she went right out to one of the uh, core hospitals. And what you saw in the last slide with Antietam was, was really a field station, and it was where the soldiers would have been treated first. And then from there, they would have gone to a field hospital, which was the next step up. And after that, they would have been, if they were well enough and able, would have been transported to a general hospital, which was somewhere around Washington, or that it could have been up north. But Cornelia, as a young woman, went straight out into the field, in, into a, uh, the Second Corps Hospital. After serving at Gettysburg, uh, and then at Camp Lettering, which was the general hospital outside of the village of, of Gettysburg, uh, she went on to continue working as a nurse in Virginia. She worked basically um, with the, with the, uh, the Second Corps, Second Army Corps. Cornelia Hancock uh, wrote a lot of letters home, and they were uh, saved and preserved and written, um, compiled as a book uh, called South After Gettysburg. And in that book um, are some very uh, vivid descriptions of what life was like in, uh, in and around Gettysburg just shortly after the battle. After my older brother and every male relative and friend that he possessed had gone to war, I deliberately came to the conclusion that I, too, would go and serve my country. I confided this resolution to my sister's husband, Dr. Henry T. Child, who lived in Philadelphia. The summons came on the morning of July 5, 1863. I was then just 23 years of age. I got into Gettysburg the night of July 6, three days after the last day of the battle. We went the same evening to one of the churches where I saw for the first time the war meant. Hundreds of desperately wounded men were stretched out on boards laid across the high back of the as closely as they could be packed together. Boards were covered with straw. Thus elevated, these poor sufferers' faces white and drawn with pain were almost on a level with my own. I seemed to stand breast high in a sea of anguish. Cornelia Hancock, July 6, 1863, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Again, immediately after the battles for the next several weeks, the wounded and the sick were being treated at four <coughs> hospitals, uh, which were set up in and around, ringing around um, Gettysburg. <coughs> it wasn't until a little bit later that a general hospital was set up. And this is an image of one of the four hospitals. Again, the words of Cornelia Hancock, just five days after the last day of fighting, tell us something about what it was like to be out on the field in the middle of July working with these uh, wounded soldiers. We had been two days on the field, go out about eight and come in about six, going ambulances or army buggies. I feel 
assured that I shall never feel qualified in anything that may happen to me hereafter. There is a great want of surgeons here. There are hundreds of great fellows who have not had their wounds dressed since the battle. There are many men without anything but a shirt lying in poor shelter tents, calling on God to take them from this world of suffering. In fact, the air is rent with petitions to deliver them from their suffering. Cornelian Hancock, July 8, 1863, Gettysburg. On July 22nd, Camp Letterman opened, and this is an area about a mile east of town and about 150 yards from the railroad, which was a good spot. There were fresh springs of water there. It was on, on a farm, so away from the town, close to the railroad where the wounded could be transported away. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I was just reading online yesterday that they're doing an archaeological uh, investigation of the, the site of Camp Letterman. Um, it's an area that um, had been neglected and forgotten by all but a few for many years. Uh, there was a stone marker there, but there was a lot of commercial development. Um, if you're coming into town, there was there's strip malls there, um, and it was just being developed without thought as to what had happened there. And it's only been in the recent past that people have considered the aftermath of the battles of Gettysburg and the medical side of the story to be important enough to preserve. And this is a, a, a photograph uh, showing the streets. It's actually the, the tents were laid out on streets so that, again, they were laying them out in a ward system. Um, and the hospital tents that you see could each hold 12 beds. They were at last off the ground. The soldiers were the, the, put on iron bedsteads with mattresses. Um, there were, the sanitary commission was there on site. Um, an organization called the U.S. Christian Commission was there on site, um, and a number of nurses and doctors from all over uh, stayed there until the end of November, late November 1862, when Camp Letterman was closed down and the last of the wounded were moved to, uh, again to hospitals in the Washington, D.C. area for the most part. There were uh, six rows of a total of 400 tents at Camp Letterman. Women like uh, Georgiana Woolsey, that the picture you saw before that had worked in the hospital transports, and her mother came to Gettysburg shortly after the battle, and they actually set up a feeding station, the sanitary commission, where soldiers that were coming in uh, from the field and that were on their way back to their regiments or on their way home could stop and have hot soup or coffee or something to refresh themselves. They got fresh clothing. And even if you can imagine um, being in in Gettysburg, the site of this horrific battle um, in, in the hot days of July, uh, there was quite a stench in the area. So one of the things that was most precious and one of the things that was given out was cologne. And it was something that was very welcome to put cologne on a kerchief and, and just be able to take a, a whiff of something fresh rather than what they were accustomed to in that area. In the meantime, the Sanitary Commission was busy working in the area around Washington, D.C. They worked not only in the hospitals, but what was known as the convalescent <coughs> camp in Alexandria, Virginia. The woman at the door is Amy Morris Bradley, and uh, there were over 200,000 soldiers who passed through this convalescent camp. Again, they weren't sick or wounded enough to be in a hospital, but they also weren't well enough to rejoin their regiment or be sent home. Amy Bradley was in charge of all the volunteers in the convalescent camp for two and a half years. She disturbed, it was in charge of distributing clothing to the needy, to preparing and serving proper food. She assisted um, discharged soldiers with their paperwork. Uh, the red tape was pretty thick even at that point. Um, they provided transportation for discharged soldiers back to Washington so they could go home. Um, the, they wrote letters home, they sent money and home to soldiers' families and provided a lot of services that really almost took the place of the soldiers' family in this particular camp. And around Washington, there were lots of hospitals where soldiers that were brought in from the field were, were sent to recuperate. And this is an image of Harewood Hospital, Army Hospital, around Washington, D.C. And this is that same hospital, Harewood Army Hospital in Washington, D.C., 
The nets you see up above the beds are mosquito nets. This is during the summer months. The Sanitary Commission was um, concerned at this point, this is after Gettysburg, um, but they were concerned with the lack of interest, believe it or not, among a lot of the people in the north. They had dwindling supplies that were really tapped after the, <coughs> the severity of the, uh, of the Gettysburg campaign. They were running out of supplies, they were running out of money. Uh, they needed to reorganize all the branch groups because what they really needed to do was make sure all the branches of the tree of the Sanitary Commission were bringing in as much uh, money and goods as they possibly could. And everything could be, be done from Washington. So the call went out and things were reorganized. And in Albany, uh, the General Secretary of the Albany Army Relief Association was named General Manager. And it was her job to go out and solicit funds and um, the support from all the local aid societies. So she actually physically visited every single little town in her area, which included areas of Schoharie County, Schenectady County, Columbia, and Saratoga counties, to talk to all these small local groups and say, we really, really need your help. Please help us. Emily Reed Barnes, um, was, uh, again, the associate manager of the Albany Armored Relief Association. She, uh, because of her ties with the Women's Central Association of Relief, became close personal friends with Louisa Lee Schuyler, and the two women went on after the war to uh, work in uh, the uh, modern-day social work. So um, Emily Reed Barnes was uh, a very um, important person in Albany, somebody we don't know very well, but she also had something to say to her group in, um, in spring of 1863. It is no longer the impulse of humanity alone which leads women of the North to devote themselves with all their energies to work on relieving suffering in our hospitals. It has become a test of patriotism, and the women who have most cheerfully accepted it as a test are the ones who work today with even greater diligence. Emily Barnes, Associate Manager, Albany Army Relief Association, Spring, 1862. This is actually a line of ambulances at Harewood Army Hospital. So when the soldiers were being brought away from the field around Gettysburg, and they were being brought to the Washington area, this is, uh, besides using trains, they were also transported by these ambulances. By the end of the year, in 1863, the need for money and supplies was so great that the Sanitary Commission started to talk among themselves about having a great big uh, row of fundraisers called uh, bazaars. And so they, they, these bazaars began in late 1863 and went on into early 1864. In Albany, the uh, Relief Bazaar took place in what is today Academy Park. If you're familiar with downtown Albany and you're standing on the steps of City Hall looking um, up Washington Avenue. The state capitol will be on your left. Academy Park would be on your right. That uh, freestanding building was constructed just to house the Albany Army Relief Bazaar. And it was taken down after the bazaar was over. Uh, the bazaar, um, the all relief sanitary fairs or relief bazaars took place in Chicago, in Philadelphia, in New York City. Brooklyn and Long Island, in Buffalo, Cleveland, and even in Poughkeepsie. This particular bazaar opened on February 22, 1864, Washington's birthday. There were 30 booths inside this wooden structure, and each booth was decorated and staffed by uh, local people, and their job was to raise money. So it would be like going to a, a fair or a carnival, where you would visit each different booth and you would purchase goods. A lot of the things that were sold were homemade things that local women in the community made <coughs> and donated. Uh, there were books for Saratoga Springs and Schenectady, and local people from Saratoga went to, uh, to staff their booth, and they sold things that were like uh, sofa cushions and pillows and little knick-knack type things just to raise money. And all that money went back into the uh, fair coffers. Uh, the grand opening was a great event, and there were lots of speeches given that night. And one of the people that spoke that night was the mayor of Albany named George Thatcher. 
and he had something very special to say to remind everyone at the fair why the, the, they were there, what the purpose was of the, of the fair itself. There is no depression so appalling as that which the soldier feels when he is conscious that he is neglected by those for whom he perils his life. In the workshops of our cities, villages, and towns, there are millions of busy fingers moved by thoughts of him at work providing for his wants. Mayor George Thatcher, Mayor of Albany, at the opening of the Albany Army Relief Bazaar, February 1864. One of the booths in the, at the bazaar was called the Military Trophies Booth. And those of you who work at this institution um, may recognize this particular slide because this is the nucleus of the collections that are here today at the Military Museum. Uh, they migrated around for a while, they were collected and saved, and finally ended up at this um, great place, this museum, which looks so wonderful today. And um, so you can see some of the arms and the battle flags. The uh, gentleman in the front um, is Francis Brownell, who is known as Ellsworth Avenger, um, who killed the um, person who assassinated Elmer Ellsworth in 1861 in Alexandria. And each of these fairs had their own celebrities, if you will, and Francis Brownell was certainly one of all of these celebrities. A lot of the um, people that staffed the booths made special clothing for the occasion. You can see that the women in this booth are wearing a very military type costume, and it was very fashionable to have your, your picture taken, either with your friends or with a member of the group. And that was another thing that helped raise money, were these uh, photographs that were taken and sold as souvenirs of this event. And another shot of the military trophies booth with, um, with Francis Brownell there. Some of the battle flags are actually, um, again, part of the, um, the New York State collection today. There was also a curiosity shop where there was taxidermy that was displayed. Uh, manuscript collections were all kinds of memorabilia, um, George Washington memorabilia, botanical specimens from all over the world. Um, there were uh, different ethnic booths, like the Irish booth and the German booth, the Russia booth. And at that point in time, um, all, the city of Albany was 40% Irish, first and second generation Irish. So this, the, the Irish booths um, ended up raising more, more money than any of the, of the other country booths and the third highest total of all the uh, booths put together. This is the United States booth, and again, they had special clothing. Uh, the woman seated in the middle is Captain James Lord Lansing, um, again, um, a descendant of uh, very well-known uh, military um, people from the Revolutionary War era, and she was a, a, a great figure in Albany until the early 20th century. In 18, April 1864, long after the bazaar closed, the bazaar was only open for a couple of weeks, but the fundraising efforts went on in Albany. There was a drawing um, on April 8, 1864 for four marble sculptures done by Erastus Dow Palmer, a very famous American sculptor who lived in Albany. And in the end, the Albany Army Relief Bazaar raised $81,908.50, which is a huge amount of money at that time. It was the fourth highest total of any sanitary fair in the country. Of course, the Metropolitan Fair in New York City raised the most money for the Sanitary Commission, $1.2 million. Um, altogether from these sanitary fairs and bazaars, the Sanitary Commission raised $2.7 million, which went right back into the efforts to provide relief for the sick and the wounded. Some of the money stayed in um, the local communities to further their efforts uh, to provide services to the Sanitary Commission. And interestingly enough, after the sanitary fair in Albany, um, the, the women had um, money left over. It was about $15,000 which they kept behind for their work. And because they wanted to invest this money at this point in their organization, um, after being three, over three years in, in organization, they had to have a man uh, join their group. Before that had been all, an all-women volunteer group. And at this point, they needed to have a, a man in their group as treasurer because that money needed to be invested. So at that point, they had one of the husband of one of their members invested that $15,000 for them, which um, the funds actually lasted until 1869. 
But again, the misery went on. Um, this is a, a photograph of after the Battle of the Wilderness in May 1864. Um, at that point, again, there were women um, on site providing um, aid, some of them associated with the Sanitary Commission, some with different regiments, and others um, uh, working for the government. And one such um, government nurse was Sophronia Buckland, who uh, to me is a very fascinating woman. She was uh, a seamstress in Auburn, New York, uh, before the war. There's really not a lot of information that I've come upon um, that tells me why she went into uh, service as a government nurse. Um, government nurses were paid, um, and there was some, um, not all nurses were perceived equally, if you will. Um, some, in some ways, the volunteers who went out with the Sanitary Commission, who were already well-to-do, were seen as a, a better sort of woman, if you would, at that point in time. And those who were accepting money um, were kind of looked down upon. Um, however, Sophronia Buckland was a single woman. Um, being a seamstress in the mid-19th century was one of the honorable ways for a woman to, uh, to uh, make money on her own. And that's what she was doing when she uh, went into into service as a government nurse. Uh, she went to work in September 1862. She served in, in and around Washington, D.C. at Point Lookout after Fredericksburg. She went back to Alexandria. She was at Gettysburg after the battles there. Then she went back to the hospitals around Washington, D.C. again, and then went south into Virginia. She was uh, nursing around White House, Virginia and City Point and also Point of Rocks down around the Petersburg area. And she returned home in May of 1865. She died in Ithaca, New York. Again, not too much is known about her, but she left behind a number of uh, uh, letters. In 1869, pretty early on after the war, she wrote a book of her experiences. And perhaps because it was so close to the end of the war, it's, it's very raw, and, and the, and the uh, language she uses is very honest and very um, heartfelt about her experiences. I find that later on when the uh, celebratory books were being written about Civil War nurses, it tended to be a little bit more um, guarded about her language. But Sophronia Buckland really told, tells it as it is. So it, unfortunately, her book is way out of print, um, but little excerpts of, of it survive. Um, so it's just, her words are just um, a, a very um, interesting way of understanding what life was like um, at that point in time. And after the Battle of the Wilderness, she did write a very important um, set of words about what her experiences were. Such dreadful suffering I hope never to witness again. The field was one vast plain of intense mortal agony, tortured by the sun and chilled by the night dews. Everywhere were groans and cries for help, Everywhere were the pleading and glassy eyes of dying men who were speechless in the delirium of death. It was a scene to appall the stars and stoutest hearts, but the excitement nerved us to shut our senses to everything but the task of relieving them as fast as possible. The dead lay by the living, the dying groaned by the dead, and still 100 ambulances poured the awful tide in upon us. Sonia Buckland. June 1864, near Cold Harbor, Virginia. This is an image of some of the U.S. Sanitary Commission workers in, near Fredericksburg in 1864. In that same summer, Emily Weed Barnes of the Albany Army Relief Association made her second visits to the hospitals around Washington. She was the major spokesman for that group, spokesperson for that group, and it was very important for her to come back and give her testimony of what she witnessed there or in and around Washington, D.C. So when she came back um, in the summer of 1864, she made an, another important speech to her group, the Albany Army Relief Association. Thank you. 
nurses that was in and around this area in 1864 was Helen Gilson. Helen Gilson was a young woman from Chelsea, Massachusetts. She worked on the hospital transports in 1862. She was at Antietam in September of 1862. She was at uh, Gettysburg at the Third Corps Field Hospital and at Camp Letterman. Um, and she was also interested in, um, in the diet kitchens. In 1864, she was outside of Fredericksburg and she talked about how difficult things were uh, dealing with the, not only the wounded soldiers, but the soldiers who had fever. And in some cases, even the workers came down with fevers, which left women like Helen Gilson alone to take care of the needs of the, of the wounded and sick men. It is hot and we are smothered by the dust. The day has been a hard one. My men in the kitchen are down with fever. I have stood all day over a raging stove making service of rules. Then later, tea for a little bit more, besides the diet for the convalescence. Yet I have come to time to visit the wards, read to the men, listen to complaints, and straighten out the abuses. Poor fellows, they are full of their miseries, their special term for all that day. Paul Louise Gilson, Army Nurse, July 8, 1864. Work in the hospitals around Washington, D.C. went on long after the battles and well into the 1865. This is Lincoln Hospital. You can tell that these are temporary buildings that were set up just to serve as uh, barrack buildings to serve as hospitals. One of the workers in the hospitals was Catherine Prescott Warmly, who served on the hospital transports in 1862. And after suffering from exhaustion during that year, she went on to uh, Portsmouth, um, New Hampshire, to work as the, the matron of that little hospital there. So after her service on the front, if you will, she went home and, and continued to serve through the war at home. And this, this is a very iconic picture of a Civil War nurse. This is Annie Bell Stubbs, who served from 1862 at Harpers Ferry, and again near Fredericksburg and Gettysburg. At this point, when this photograph was taken, she was matron of number one hospital, which had a thousand beds at Nashville, and hospital number eight until the end of the war. The Albany Army Relief Association didn't disband until 1869. They distributed the remaining funds that they had among the needy soldiers' families. And in a very important way, this was an early predecessor of what is modern day casework for social work. Um, Louisa Lee Schuyler and Emily B. Barnes worked together on the State Charities Aid Bureau. Um, Eliza uh, and um, the Woolsey sisters worked on uh, nursing, setting up nursing schools. So many of the women that were involved in the Sanitary Commission and in nursing in general went on to work after the war in uh, social work and in nursing and made very important contributions to, uh, to their fields at that point in time. It was an experience that um, changed their lives forever, something that I hope is not forgotten and something that deserves a lot more research time. Um, there's a few minutes, I think, for, for questions or comments, and again, afterwards, there are some um, books and materials up on the front table that I brought in for people to look at, including hospital garments. Yes? It was a private group. They, they had to be sanctioned by the government because they were working closely with, with the army, but they were a private civilian run organization. At the same time, wasn't there a war sign, wasn't there a medical pool? Yes, there was. So they had a, did they coordinate? They, they coordinated, and um, in the beginning, uh, on the peninsula in 1862, there were some serious clashes with the medical director, Charles Trickler. Um, but again, it was something that the medical department was completely unprepared for the scale and the scope of the war uh, and um, supply on the supply end and the transportation end, they couldn't handle it. So right away, um, the sanitary commission stepped in to provide that arm of uh, assistance to the government, to the army. In the, in the back. For the most part, no. 
Um, it was something that um, not every woman was cut out for and not able to do. There were, uh, if you read some of these ladies' accounts, these women's accounts, there were women who went down who, who shouldn't have been there that were just there to um, to say that they'd been there as benevolent, good Christian women. But the, the women that went into into the service uh, as nurses were not formally trained, and um, they learned on the job. They were tutored by other by uh, other surgeons, and some of them did end up doing things like dressing and field stations. Um, some of them ended up basically running the wards in the hospital, so they were concerned with making sure that um, the soldiers were fed properly, that the diet was supervised, that the linens were clean, things that are necessary for any, any hospital. Um, and actually